Aloha, you're listening to Chad Ford's NBA Big Board on the Lockdown Podcast Network. I'm with Sports Illustrated's Jeremy Wu. We're going to talk 2022 NBA Draft. Here we go. All right, I'm with Jeremy Wu. Jeremy, where are you, where are you coming from uh, today? I am here in Chicago. Uh, I think last time we spoke, I may have still been living in New York. Uh, I, I moved back to Chicago over the summer where I'm from, so I'm, I'm here, I'm settled, um, ready ready to go. <laughs> Chicago's my, my favorite city. I grew up in Kansas City, but a lot of relatives in Chicago love it uh, as well. Missed, uh, missed going to those NBA draft combines there, my favorite draft uh, moment of the year every year. Yeah, no, the real reason uh, I'm hoping the Combine stays at DePaul like they had it this year because I can walk there now, which is going to be amazing. Uh, knock on wood. Awesome. <laughs> but awesome. uh, uh, yeah, I was at Memphis last week at their pro day. So I've kind of been getting back into the swing of the season and whatnot. So if you've been listening to our podcast, you know, we've had Jeremy on multiple times. He's a guy that's just all over not only the NBA draft, but the recruiting scene as well, which is especially helpful this time of year as we start to introduce a, a huge group of freshmen who always sort of dominate the top of every draft uh, this year. And Jeremy, this year, last year, we kind of knew Kate Cunningham, definitely the guy uh, at the top. And then we kind of knew Jalen Green and Evan Mobley, probably sort of in that order. Like really early on, we kind of knew what the top three was going to look like in this draft. To me, this year is wide open talking to NBA general managers about who the top guys are. I've counted up to seven guys now that different general managers have said to me, this guy might be my favorite guy to be the number one pick. It doesn't seem like there's a consensus uh, out there at all this year. And the other thing, uh, and I'm kind of curious for your take on this as well, NBA scouts not quite as excited about this draft as they were last year's draft. They like this draft. They don't think it's a bad draft, but a lot of it has to actually do with a lot of the top guys in this year's draft are big men, which just don't quite have the same value in the NBA that uh, that big men used to have, let's say, you know, 15 years ago. And so not as many wings as maybe they want at the top of the draft. I'm curious what you think about overall this draft class, and then let's hear your vote for who's your early favorite to be the number one pick in the draft. Yeah, I, I honestly feel like I'm still kind of getting a handle on it. Like, you know, the the top guys, you know, I've all seen in some capacity. So at least we – at least we have a sense of that. Um, I can't really speak to the depth of this right now just because I think, you know, I was just remarking to someone earlier today, like, uh, you know, the first six weeks of the season are going to be huge. Non-conference play is going to be huge because there are, you know, a lot of guys who, you know, have an opportunity to kind of play their way, uh, you know, into this year's draft and kind of leave a mark and, uh, you know, sort of show that they've turned a corner. Um, I think there's a really, really, um, you know, big, big, space uh, for, for breakout guys uh, just because, you know, really you can get to maybe 12, maybe 15 names you feel like fairly good about as like, these are guys who are, you know, first roundish type type players. And after that, it gets a lot harder. Um, so, uh, you know, I feel I, I'm interested in this draft class. I think, you know, to your point, you know, there are a lot of bigs, uh, but I also think there are a lot of, you know, kind of versatile uh, wings who can shoot. Uh, which is, is generally a good thing, generally something people need. It is not, uh, at least right now, it doesn't, does not look like a particularly strong guard class. Um, so, uh, like I said, there's going to be time for, the, for all this to kind of, kind of play out. Um, you know, for me, and I, you know, I, I have polled people kind of at various times in the last few months and or about the number one pick, um, you, you know, pa- Apollo uh, Banchero is, is probably my, uh, number one pick coming into the season. Uh, you know, that's who I had there uh, for our, you know, early rankings. Uh, I would probably just err towards him like a hair uh, over, over Holmgren. Um, but I, I think, you know, Jaden Hardy is probably a dark horse in that conversation as well. Um, and I think, uh, you know, I, I also to your point, um, the excitement is not quite what it was last year with, with Cunningham and green and, and Mobley. All right. Let's talk about Ben Chero, a guy that, 
is one of the most mentioned players when you think about a guy that's the, the potential number one pick in the draft. But here's the thing that I hear about him all the time, like solid all the way around. But is there anything that he does that spectacular? And that seems to be, he seems to be for, for scouts that want to play it safe, the favorite for the number one pick, because it's hard to find holes in his games. Again, very, very confident that he is going to be a very, very solid player um, at the next level at the NBA. What's, what's the ceiling on a guy like Banchero? Yeah, I, I think that is the big question, uh, and, and and you know it's kind of it's going to sound silly uh, me me saying this now, but I remember watching him for the first time uh, at USA, uh, I, I think two summers ago, uh, and he was one of the better bigs there. But I, you know, not at any point did I think, oh, this guy is like you know number one pick level prospect. I didn't think that then. Uh, you know, I thought he was going to be kind of like. Um, you know, he there were some similarities to like a Boris Boris Diaw, like Carlos Boozer, like that type of player, uh, which is you know was very intriguing then. Um, but you know, then it basically he you know in the last couple of years he has grown a little bit. He's reworked his body. He's in really good shape, and I think it totally probably changes the way that now we look at his role. Right? He he you know he's kind of a was sort of a heavier not fat but like you know a heavier you know body type, and now he's really slimmed down and. Um, you know, it's, it's going to be fascinating. I mean, I think he's definitely, if you're taking him number one, if we drafted today, it would be more like the safe pick. Not, not that I don't want to, you know, say that with a negative connotation. Sometimes the safe pick, you know, we think about that negatively, but I don't think that's the case. Um, uh, but upside wise, I mean, I'm just curious to see, uh, you know, how he scores, uh, this year. Um, you know, if he's really, I know he's made progression towards being sort of a face-up guy. You know, if he's really a kind of face-up, inside-out player, uh, I think, you know, he's a great passer. You know, that's going to translate. Uh, his shot, you know, he's not a high, high-level shooter, but he can shoot. You know, I, I think all these things are going to be – I guess what I'd put it is, I, I think if, if his offensive ceiling uh, looks like it's there where he can really score all three levels and, you know, be deployed and – a number of different spots. And I, I think that there is some upside for sure. Um, but he, he is not the type of player that we generally ascribe like, Oh, you know, amazing length, amazing vertical, super projectable. He's not that right. Yeah. He, he's a guy that, that has stumped me a little bit on that end. Like I, I see the, I see the value, a highly intelligent player. That's something that's really comes to mind. Really great feel for the game, knows how to play the game. Uh, I see maybe again, we're getting back to this era of big guys that become elite passers and, you know, something I think he could become as well. But again, not, not particularly explosive athletically um, to, to your point, he's slimmed down, but looks like maybe his lateral mobility could be a, a major question mark, especially as he gets bigger and, and older um, as well. Some of the NBA scouts I talked about are like, can he keep that weight off? Or is it again, just sort of his body frame and type that he's going to get heavy. And, and those are the sort of questions like what's the one, and then from a skill set, what's the one thing besides the fact that I think he's a very highly intelligent player and really sees the floor. Uh, well, that do you hang his game on and you know look that's helpful to have a really smart and then physically strong player like that i mean that that's certainly a valuable player in the nba but does he does he do anything that's transcendent and i think again that's sort of the question mark um, for him right now and let's compare him to chet holmgren then these two guys have kind of battled away uh, for a while could it be different physically chet one of the skinnier dudes. I mean, we had Poku in the draft last year, two years ago. So I guess, you know, that's something, but like one of the skinnier dudes that you'll ever see incredibly skilled, uh, a very, very, uh, very, very great resume. Uh, if you want to look at what he's done for team USA and what he's done in high school, but it's hard to like, think of like what kind of player, you know, <laughs> who he is um, at the next level. So skilled, uh, so talented. I think strength is the issue. If he was 25, 30 pounds heavier, he probably be would, would be the no-brainer number one pick in this year's draft. How do you project him at the next level? Yeah, you know, he definitely, I think, has kind of assuaged some of the concerns about, uh, you know, he's so unusual. And, and like, I, I think that's why, 
you know, if we're just trying to like handicap who goes first, like Chet, he, he might just be so unusual that, you know, teams get scared off. Uh, just if you, if you are picking first, you know, the connotations that come with that, uh, you know, whatever risk is perceived, right? I mean, I, I think he probably is going to look a little bit scarier just because how, you know, how many guys with his type of frame stay healthy. Uh, I think that's going to be a question, right? I, th- I think, um, I actually think, you know, his floor is fairly solid. The question is just like, what is that worth? Like I can, I can see him being like a Porzingis level player, um, you know, and maybe honestly, probably better than that. Uh, but again, you know, now we are talking about Porzingis, you know, the last couple of years, his value has totally shifted. Uh, you know, he has become, gone from, you know, unicorn to kind of a replaceable, unique, but kind of replaceable player. And again, it's kind of a referendum on how we value centers. Right. But Chet, it's probably gonna have to be a four because I don't think he's going to be able to, you know, e- even with, you know, teams don't really post that much anymore, but even, even noting that, you know, it's going to be hard for him to, you know, with that frame, you know, bang on the inside. So I think, you know, to make the most of him, he's going to have to be sort of a perimeter player. Uh, you know, he's super skilled. He's tough, you know, like he's, he's definitely not soft. Like, you know, sometimes with guys who are so thin, people kind of label them that, but he's not that right. So, uh, and like you said, he's proven he has a good resume. Although I, I do think, uh, you know, I've had a couple of people bring up the game at the under 19s where, you know, he went up against Wembanyama and was kind of overshadowed. Right. So, uh, you know, all these things are kind of pieces of the puzzle. Um, I'm sure he'll look good at Gonzaga because in that conference, there's not going to be many teams who can really expose him, uh, you know, and if Gonzaga has to play his own to honestly, they, that, that might be, they may, may be better off doing that just to use him as a shot blocker, right? So uh, evaluating him will be interesting depending on how much they kind of, you know, cater to that or away from, you know, his weaknesses, right? So. Well, look, Wimbanyana would be, to me, hands down the number one pick in this draft if he was I agree. Uh, eligible for this draft. And so being outclassed by the guy that probably would have been the num- not only the number one pick in this year's draft, I, I think he would have went ahead of Kate Cunningham. Uh, if he'd been in the draft before, I mean, that that's how good a prospect he is. That's there's no real shame in that. And I, I, I like one point that you made watching Chet there's, he's thin, but he's not soft. Like you said, there's a toughness, there's an aggressiveness to his game and the scouts that really like him say, you know, look, this is a very hard comparison to make. It's very hard to ever compare a, a young player to a hall of famer, but there's some Kevin Garnett to his game. And just that, you know, Kevin was wiry. Uh, he was, he never got, he never really bulked up, but he was so mentally strong and tough that it, it really didn't matter um, at the next level. And they see some of that in chat, which I think is, uh, you know, again, it's not totally fair. I'm not sure we're ever going to get another Kevin Garnett um, in the game, but there, there's that. And there's a skill level there. You know, we're watching Evan Mobley right now. And for people who didn't really follow him in college and were skeptical, you know, watching him on the Cavs the other night, bring the ball up the floor, dribble behind his back, uh, you know, lead the break, make a pass, uh, you know, shooting the ball from the wing, uh, getting the ball at the elbow, uh, creating off the dribble or making the pass right now. There's a place in the league for bigs that are versatile like this. And I think Chet, like Evan Mobley in that, in that respect, uh, have have a lot has a skill set that makes him more valuable than just sort of thinking about him as a traditional big guy yeah yeah i'd agree and i think you know the game is kind of now it seems like it's now going towards that where you know i I think teams will always play fives like i don't think i still if if it ever happens i think we're still a ways away from you know having a league where there really are no like traditional fives because people are always still going to want size they're always going to be coaches who want size but uh, you know, the nature of those guys is changing. We're seeing more guys with, you know, size and legit skills, um, you know, like Chet and like, and like Manchero. Uh, and, you know, when Benyama, you know, in that vein as well coming up. So, uh, you know, I mean, maybe, maybe that's just kind of what's coming. Um, and I, but I, I think the advantage that both of these guys have uh, going for them is that they're going to be able to play out of different spots on the court. Um, you know, they should both be able to do some, you know, pick and pop, some screening, some face up, right? Like it's not going to, basically it's not going to hurt them that no one posts up anymore. Uh, right. They, they have plenty of other offensive, uh, you know, strengths that can kind of, right. Like we're not talking about dinosaurs here. So, so that's why it, the center conversation is always tough to articulate, but I think both these guys are good fits just because of that versatility. 
All right, Jeremy and I talked about probably the two guys that get mentioned the most uh, by scouts as as potential number one picks in the draft. And again, very different players, uh, though both traditional big men. When we come back, we'll talk about a few other players that are, are getting looks as potential number one picks in the NBA draft as well. But before we do so, I want to talk about fantasy sports experts at Sleeper. In 2018, they realized that fantasy basketball was broken. Games were being won and lost based on whose players had more scheduled games that week. It made no sense and required very little strategy. So in 2020, Sleeper released a brand new way of playing fantasy basketball. It's called Game Pick. It's only available on Sleeper. In Game Pick, owners pick a single game per week for each starter to count towards their team's total score, ensuring an even number of games played between opponents. The days of losing because your opponent's players simply had more scheduled games to play in that week are over. The days of mindless daily busy work are over. The days of giving up halfway through the season because of that busy work also over. In Game Picks, you pick one game per week for each player based on player matchups, home versus away, opponent's defensive rating, pace of play, and more. All of that adds up to more strategy, less busy work. Whether you prefer redraft, keeper, or dynasty, Game Picks has you covered. Sleeper crack the fantasy basketball cold. If you play fantasy football, if you prefer building out a weekly strategy versus daily busy work, you're going to love Game Picks. Download the Sleeper app and start a league with your own friends today. You will not be disappointed. Sleeper, download the Sleeper app today. All right, I'm back with Jeremy Wu. We're talking 2022 NBA Draft. We talked about Paolo Banchero. We talked about Chet Holmgren. Let's go to the G League for a second where Jaden Hardy is going to be this year's Jalen Green in that he's going to be a high-scoring guard playing on the G League Ignite team. They're not the same player. Uh, I don't I don't think Hardy is the explosive athlete that Jalen Green is, but maybe Hardy, a little bit more well-rounded, can actually play uh, a, a little more point guard, I think, than we saw Jalen Green playing uh, for the G League Ignite right now. What do you think about his game and his chances of being the number one pick in the draft? Yeah, I, I would say if we, I mean, if we had to pick a dark horse right now, for number one, it would be him. I don't think it's necessarily likely unless he like really, really lights it up and forces the issue, right? Um, but I, I do think it is probably more wide open still than we think, just because you know the questions we just kind of went over with the first two guys. They are bigs. Hardy is a guard, uh, and he's also really good. Um, I watched him play a pretty good amount um, a couple years ago in in high school. Um, and uh, got a pretty good feel for what he can do. I mean, he uh, is such a good shooter. Uh, he doesn't really have a lot of holes in his game. Uh, you know, he, he competes. Uh, like you said, I think he can. He's probably not a true point guard, but he can play make a little bit. Uh, he's not like he's able to be high volume without being a pig, which I always appreciate. Like it's his shot selection never super scared me. Like he did a good job. I thought of you know in high school getting other guys involved and it wasn't like he took shots that were like utterly ridiculous or made me like shake my head at him, which is generally good when you're a teenager and you kind of have that figured out. Um, So, uh, you know, I'm very curious to see what type of efficiency, uh, you know, he'll be able to post, but I I do think sort of the strength of his game is the jumper. I do expect that to translate. Um, Now the question I think would be, is he too jumper centric at the next level? Like I'd like to see him get to the rim a little bit more. Um, but uh, you know he one once he you know basically he grew a little bit in in high school and once he it was like an inch or you know maybe an inch and a half but just that one little growth spurt to me made a huge difference just just watching him play and that was you know a couple years ago right around when I saw him I guess it was his middle of his junior year um, you know he's he's smooth he, he he's not like Jalen Green where he's gonna like explode to a spot but he's you know he he's smooth he's skilled um, you know he's gonna be able to get to the spots he wants. Uh, and I think he'll be, you know, pretty effective. I, I would think uh, for Ignite. I think you pointed out earlier in the podcast. This isn't a strong guard draft to begin with. He's definitely my favorite guard in this draft. And and I think from a positional standpoint, if he gets to the number one pick in the draft, some of it's going to be based off position with teams maybe coveting that position more than coveting the big, really, because most of the guys that we're talking about in the top five are bigs. And there isn't a lot of uh, guard play after there. So if you're going to pass on a guard here, there might not be a guard available for quite a long time in this draft uh, that you're really that excited about again. I, I really like him. I think he's a great shot maker. I, I think that he's going to show some versatility. I'm really interested to see him on the G League Ignite as well, because I, I think that I think 
that this was a success last year. I think it really helped us get comfortable with Jalen Green and even to a certain extent with Jonathan Kaminga uh, last year. I think this this G League Ignite team this year maybe doesn't have the star, quite the star power of a Jalen Green and a Jonathan Kaminga, but there's still a lot of talent on this team. Uh, and I think Hardy really has the p- uh, potential to shine here. So I, I definitely think that he's going to be in the mix. If you just sort of look at the teams right now that are most likely to have a number one pick uh, in the draft like this year, a lot more than need guard play than they need big guys right now. Uh, now there's a few that need big guys. So I think a lot of it may end up being dependent on, you know, what happens on the lottery night, which we won't know for, for quite a long time. Let's talk about my guy. Uh, if, if it was me choosing right now for the number one pick, um, I think it would be Yannick Zosa. Uh, who's playing over in Spain right now, I I think his resume at what he was doing at the ACB at his age is so impressive. We have a long track record now of seeing when players are playing at the highest level of Europe at their age and they're thriving, one, we got to pay attention to that. That, that's, That's almost as telltale a sign as you can see that these guys are really good, in part because in Europe, there's no incentive just to develop these young guys. They, they play to win basketball games. That's the, the, the only reason a young guy gets on the floor is if he can actually help you win basketball games. Everybody knows that Zosa is going to the NBA. Uh, and so there's not a huge advantage in just playing him minutes just to develop him. Uh, I, I think he has one of the great motors, great speed for a player his size. I think defensively, this is one of the best young big defenders we've seen come in the draft uh, in in a while offensively i think he is a definitely more of a a project uh to say the least but i talked to some of his teammates over there i've talked to you know some coaches over there as well they absolutely love him think he has incredible work ethic think he's really driven uh, to succeed i think when we stack up resumes at the end of the day he probably is going to have the strongest resume for the number one pick in the draft I think you had a number four on your uh, watch list um, early on. What do you think about his game and his potential to be the number one pick in the draft? Yeah, I, I'm really fascinated by him um, just because, you know, I mean, he's probably one of the best. I have not seen him play live yet, so it's hard for me to like, I never like to like really firm up how I feel, but I mean, I might not get to see him, so I'm going to have to decide this anyway. But uh, uh, he just looks like he's going to be an absolute like, destroyer defensively. Like he's going to guard whoever you want. Uh, you know, he's so long. Uh, he is so fluid, um, pretty agile for his size. Uh, and I think, you know, what we were just talking about, you know, well, is the NBA kind of going towards these, you know, big skilled 6'10", 6'11", 7 foot guys? Well, this is a guy who's going to be able to guard all those guys, right? So I think that's, you know, going to be, you know, I, that's why I think you have to think about him as, a, as an early pick. Um, I don't know offensively. I've, I probably watched, you know, three or four of his games. Um, so I, I haven't seen him enough to where I have like conviction about how I feel yeah, offensively. Uh, I'm not entirely sure, you know, what his, his role is going to be on offense yet. Uh, but he does, you know, he has these long strides where when he gets down out of the basket, it's like, Oh, that's kind of looks like Giannis, right? Not that he's going to be that. Yeah. I doubt no one's going to be that. That's, you know, not what I'm right. saying, but, <laughs> yeah. but you just, you know, watch the way he moves and covers ground with his, his length and his, his wingspan and, you know, whatever it is. And, uh, it's it's uh, unusual stuff. So, you know, I think how he evolves, whether, you know, he ends up developing more as like a rim rolling big uh, or if he does have some type of skill element to his game will kind of determine uh, what his ceiling is. But even even if he's just a center who can't play off the floor ever and is going to like guard whoever, like that's pretty valuable. So uh, yeah. that's how I feel right now. Yeah, the, the skill level the skill level is still a work in progress. But I think to your point, he's a young player, and there, there's still plenty of time for that part to develop. But you can't teach the quickness, the speed uh, at his size, and the willingness to defend. And like you said, it's we we sometimes I think get hyperbolic about oh this guy can guard five positions you know on the floor. There's actually very few people that I think can do that. I, I believe Scotty Barnes last year was probably the guy that you could say, yeah, I think Scotty can guard guard one through five um, in the NBA. I think uh, Zoso is a guy that definitely is going to be able to guard at least three fours and fives uh, and may have the speed to be able to even do more than that. Uh, and it's just, again, how his offensive game develops. But uh, what he's doing at his age, I think is just so impressive right now uh, that I just don't think you can you can ignore it. 
Let's talk about one other big guy. This guy reclassified this year. You just actually saw him down at the at the Memphis Pro Day, uh, Jalen Duran, uh, a guy who was one of the top prospects in the high school class of 2022, reclassifies in the 2021 class, is going to be at Memphis this year, um, playing with Amoni Bates uh, as well. You got to see him in the uh, Memphis Pro Day. So I'm curious what you think about him. Also, what you thought about Bates, who is ineligible for the 2022 draft. But if he were eligible, my guess is he would also be in this conversation that we're having right now. Yeah. Um, so pro days are always kind of, it's tough to know how much you should take away. Uh, you know, for me, I, I saw both those guys play at Peach Jam over the summer. So it wasn't like I was, you know, looking at them with fresh eyes. You know, I just kind of had recently seen them. So I kind of knew what to expect. So um I mean, Duran, you know, I think it's a pretty good bet. He's a lottery pick. Um, I wouldn't put him in the conversation for number one just because I think he is more of a traditional five, um, which is, you know, increasingly hard to, at least for me, to justify saying I want that guy above all these other guys, right? For, so for me, I wouldn't put him in that conversation, but I do think um, it's not to say he won't be a pretty solid uh, NBA player. Like, I think. You know, being a little bit younger, being that he has not turned, you know, he turns 18 in, in November, having reclassified. So, uh, you know, he'll be one of the younger guys in the draft. Uh, you know, he had, doesn't had, physically look, he physically looks like he could be in the NBA right now. Which right. Is, and, which is and, pretty amazing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And he's had that kind of crazy chiseled body, uh, you know, since he was 15. Right. So, um, you know, I, I think it's hard to see him totally failing. Um, although, you know, I think he, they listed him at 6'11". I don't think he's 6'11". I think he's more like 6'9", 6'10", 6'9 and a half, right? So, you know, splitting hairs, but I, it's not like but he's a, like, But a 7'5", but like a 7'5". Big wingspan, wingspan. Yeah. Yeah. But it, yeah. But it's not like he's like a guy who's going to be mistaken for a 7-footer. Like you put him next to a real 7-footer and he's, he's smaller. Uh, but, you know, anyway, um, the, the thing with me for him is he's just going to have to at some point realize um, – you know, what it is, is going to be asking him at the next level uh, and like, and how to sort of play to his strength. Cause so I think he, he has moments where he just wants to moonlight as like a skill player when in reality, like he needs to be, a, I think he needs to be a five. Um, you know, he's, he's big and strong, but he doesn't really like want to beat you up. Right. He's not like a, as physical of a player as he could be, I'd like to see him, you know, start to do some of the, more of those things like screen harder, like use that body he has to really like make a difference. Um, Cause I, you know, I, I think there's obviously a place for that in the NBA and he's a very good passer. People are, I'm sure will make a big deal of that. I'm sure he'll get compared to them out of bio, uh, but he's not, at least to me at, at this stage of his career, he's not like Bam where he just wants to like go beat you up every single game and like dominate physically. He's not that maybe he gets there. Uh, but for you know, for me, having watched Jalen the last couple of years, I don't think he's that yet. So interestingly, you know, Bam slides at Kentucky because he doesn't really show that at Kentucky his freshman year as well, and and ends up sliding in the draft a little bit. So you know, it's interesting with these young players too, and and what playing at Memphis will do for him this year. I know a lot of scouts that I talked to were want to see his motor and just how hard he went in the pro day. And it was interesting. Some people were really impressed, thought he went hard, and some people were still dinging him, saying, look, he went hard on some plays. On other plays, he kind of took things off. Um, you know, definitely motor seems to be a question mark for him and how consistent it's going to be, uh, where something like Zosa, that's definitely never going to be a question mark for him, the way he, how hot he goes. How is Amoni Bates? I mean, you know, one of the big controversies was they did this pro day measurements uh, and he measured with a wingspan that was two inches shorter that literally no NBA scout that I talked to believes this could be true uh, and measured with athletic numbers that would, would have ranked at the very bottom of the NBA draft combine in, in 2021. Uh, so a guy that's been hyped since what, eighth grade. Uh, is now getting all eyes on him playing at the college level. Another guy that re reclassified. How do you think his pro day went? Yeah, so so I, I have a few thoughts about this, and I've watched him play, you know, a bunch. You know, I went I went up to Michigan to see him play a couple years ago in high school. Um, I've been able to see him enough that I have a fairly good handle on him now. I think here, here's what I'll say about the measurements. Um, obviously, they're not great, uh, but I think we just have to keep in mind. Look, he's younger than everybody else. Um, you know, if uh, 
you know, assuming they don't like petition and get him in this year's draft. I don't know how that would happen. Maybe it would. I don't know. I'm just, just, you know, thinking out loud, but assume, let's assume he's in the 23 draft, you know, physically he could just be a lot different <laughs> in a year than he is now. Right. You know, having he, his body already looks better in terms of, you know, being in the weight room, he looks stronger. His posture has gotten a little bit better in the upper body. So like, you know, I think that's coming around, but I think what we can infer, and I was talking to someone else about this this morning. Um, I, I think we can say that, it is a concern where you say, will he really have a marked physical advantage in the NBA? And I think right now the answer is probably not. And I think that's the key question you have to ask because, uh, you know, he has been billed as, you know, this high usage, you know, I'm a bucket, going to go shoot and score. And he, he is a very good shooter. Um, you know, he's better with his feet set. He's can make tough shots, but isn't where he's like automatic. Like he's not like Kevin Durant where he's going to be like automatically knocking those in. Right. So um, I think, I think that the key thing with him is just, and for me, it's trying, trying to just, um, you know, be responsible because he, he got so much hype so early and I didn't really understand where it came from originally. So I feel kind of, I felt a little bit bad for him because it kind of came so fast. And uh, I, I think, you know, now I think it's just a matter of, well, you know, they're, they're trying to play him at point guard. I don't know how that's going to go because I don't think he's really like a ball screen player and they're going to want to put him in screens with, with Jalen Duran. So we'll see. Maybe he moves off and plays more of the, a wing role uh, later in the season. I don't know. Um, but I, I will say, you know, I, a lot of people were kind of down on him over the summer. He wasn't especially good at Peach Jam. Uh, but I have heard, you know, coming out of Memphis that he, he's doing what he's supposed to do. You know, he's he's been solid, you know, for them. Um, so, so I, I think it's probably better with, with Bates to kind of withhold judgment and kind of see how he plays and judge him on that, uh, rather than the trajectory stuff. But, uh, you know, like I said, the big question for me is just, will he ever have a physical advantage other than being tall? Because if you're just tall in the NBA, it's not enough. Let's so, so I I'm, I'm hearing from you, Jeremy, look, if he were, if he, if he somehow gets, and, and by the way, you're hearing this with, uh, with Wimbanyana's uh, camp as well. You're hearing this with uh, Amoni Bates' camp. You're hearing this with Scoot Henderson's camp, that they're going to try to get them into this draft. I don't see a path uh, because I think for that to happen, you have to get an agreement with the Players Association. And up to this point, the NBA has been unwilling to concede anything to get that agreement from the Players Association. I don't think that's going to change. The NBA, I think, is very open to reducing the age limit down to 18 or, or what have you. It's the players association that wants something back from the NBA in return. I don't know how the NBA grants individual exceptions for this. Uh, you know, certainly maybe there's going to be a change of heart from the players association, but I don't, I don't think so because NBA veterans don't really have an incentive to be letting in more and more uh, talented prospects. It takes jobs away from NBA veterans uh, every time that it happens. So uh, I just, I don't see this resolved anytime soon until I think that there's a full collective bargaining agreement opening up again. And so uh, all of this talk, and I hear the chatter from all of his camps, uh, you know, Scoot Henderson's camp, whatever, that they're going to be in the draft this year. I know they're not eligible. They're going to be, uh, I'm, I'm highly skeptical uh, that that is, that is going to be the case. Uh, one last guy from Memphis that uh, I was surprised to hear as much buzz on as I did because he wasn't a guy that I was I was actually sort of factoring into this year's draft, maybe down the road. Uh, Josh Minot, uh, a guy who stood out uh, in the in the pro day to the point that uh, I had several NBA scouts say, you know, he should be on your on your top thirty watch list this year, uh, where I kind of maybe had him down the road, maybe you know 2022, 2023 draft, what have you. Uh, what do you think about him and his uh, NBA prospects? This was so that was my first time seeing seeing Minot. Um, I did not go to Iverson, so I, I hadn't seen him before. Before this, uh, I, I was impressed. I think I still err more on the side of like he's probably a couple years away because I think it's pretty clear he doesn't know how to play basketball yet, and he's still kind of like has like the I'm learning kind of air about him where <laughs> you know he'll, he'll make a great play and then he will kind of be lost for a little bit and he'll make another great play, but. Uh, you know, he's, he's really, really got great size. Um, you know, he's, he's like broader in the shoulders than I expected, you know, physically he's going to fit what you want from, you know, a combo, you know, probably will be, end up being more of a four. I don't, I don't see, I would be surprised if he like took a big enough skill and feel leap to really be like a three. Cause the three is now such a decision-making position too. You can't really like hide guys at the three unless he's an elite shooter, which he's not. So I don't really quite understand what he is yet. Um, but definitely he is a guy who is on the radar. Um, I'm not sure if he'll start 
you know, they have a lot of guys who, you know, could play, you know, 15, 20 minutes a game. So I, I think that'll probably, you know, I don't think they're expecting him to be one and done. I, if I had to bet right now, I bet he's probably two or three. Um, but definitely there is upside there just with his, his size, uh, his potential, you know, to you know, handle the ball a little bit um, and do different things. Uh, that definitely kind of a, sort of kind of fits the mold as like, you know, a later blooming um, type guy who oftentimes you do see their stock kind of skyrocket late because all, all it takes is the flashes of them turning the corner for, you know, a team to be like, why not? Well, let's do it, you know. Yeah. Uh, let's just talk about Joshua Primo, right? Like a guy that we wouldn't have projected that same way. Even Patrick Williams, frankly, you know, probably at the start doesn't, isn't going to start for Florida state probably isn't going to get there. Then there gets this, uh, uh, irrational, irrational exuberance that starts to happen, you know, right before the draft as well. So interesting to see JT Thor is another guy that I wouldn't have necessarily thought, um, would it would have stayed in the draft and what have you. So it's hard to predict anymore. Uh, even when guys don't start or even when they have limited roles, sometimes they're still uh, making their way to the NBA right away. Uh, when we come back, we'll talk about some of the other uh, guys that we think are potential lottery picks in the 2022 draft. But before we do so, it would not be an NBA Big Board podcast without talking about Built Bar. Uh, did you know the Built Bar has many delicious flavors, so many for everybody? If you don't know the Built Bar flavors, you're missing out. There's coconut, cherry, barcia, raspberry, mint brownie, double chocolate, salted caramel, strawberry, orange, cookies and cream, German chocolate. There's one for everyone. My personal favorite is a coconut. It tastes like a mountains bar. It's chewy. It's delicious. It tastes like a candy bar, but they're healthy too. Most of the flavors have 17 to 18 grams of protein. Their calories range from 130 to 180. There's only four to five grams of sugar, only four to five grams of net carbs. Order today. Get your grasshopper cookie, your raspberry, whatever you like. Built Bar is also the official protein bar of the U.S. track and field team. Go to BuiltBar.com and use promo code LOCK15. You'll get 15% off your first order. Use promo code LOCK15 for 15% off at BuiltBar.com. All right, and I'm back with Jeremy Wu of Sports Illustrated. We are talking 2022 NBA Draft. I've been writing a bunch about it right now over at NBABigBoard.com right now. Jeremy just had his top 30 watch list. He's going to be writing about uh, some of his uh, experiences, uh, watching some of these pro combines as well. Let's just talk about some of the other prospects now that, that are in this draft. We talked about a lot of the guys that are going to be sitting at the very top, but there's still a lot of depth in the lottery. And I actually think this is where there's a lot of depth in this particular draft with, with a lot of guys that really intrigue you right now. After those guys that we just talked about are off the board, Jeremy, who's your favorite player right now in this draft? Um, yeah, you know, I, I favorite, I'm still kind of, figuring out like i try not to like slap superlatives on guys too quick but um i i mean i think outside of the guys we haven't talked about yet uh you know i'm really interested to see what caleb houston does uh yeah. for michigan this year i just i think he despite being like a somewhat boring player uh is also a very good player <laughs> and like uh it's, i think i think his floor is, is pretty significant to where you know i can see him you know being a pretty solid you know lock to go in the top 10 uh another player and he, and he has that yeah. and he has the wing wing position as well so he's now p playing the, the position that everybody covets in the nba mm -hmm. certainly yeah. impressed with his defense uh for team canada uh this this year in the under 19s as well yeah and he's become a much more confident shooter like i to me that was the biggest thing where you know, at montbird he was always kind of a you know when he was younger he was more of a four played sort of a small role now he's like launching threes confidently which is a great sign i think he'll be a pretty good shooter uh, and you know he does a lot of things well. He doesn't have a lot of like he's not you know not not going to be like a creative ball handler, but he does doesn't really have a ton of like glaring holes in, in, in his skill set either. So uh, you know I think he's probably in that next mix as a very interesting lottery guy who is very easy to you know fit onto any roster, right? Like fit won't be an issue for him because everyone needs versatile six nine guys. Um, Jabari Smith from Auburn, people have brought up to me uh, as you know a, a pretty good bet to be a top ten pick. Um, I did not go to the Auburn Pro Day, but, you know, people were, you know, that, that was sort of the takeaway I heard from there, um, you know, that he, you know, he may not be like insanely productive as a freshman, but like he's just one of those types of players where you see the potential and the skill level um, and the, you know, the finesse in his game. And you're like, you know, that's uh, someone we want to develop. So, you know, those two guys are probably going to be in that lottery convo. Uh, you know, Patrick Baldwin, uh, I'm very interested to see. I, I think he's dealing with like a minor injury right now is what I heard. I don't know. I don't know exactly what it is. So I don't want to get into it. I don't think it's super serious. Um, 
but you know, assuming he can stay healthy all season, you know, teams will get a long enough look at him. You know, he'll he'll be in that Lowry convo as well. And those three guys, you know, kind of play similar roles, so it's going to be interesting. Yeah, Jabari, uh, a guy that drew a lot of praise from the NBA scouts that I talked to in that Auburn pro day. Um, obviously, they were a little bit frustrated. Alan Flanagan uh, injured right now. Uh, Walker Kessler uh, ended up with a concussion and was pulled uh, from the pro day. Uh, but they, but it, it did allow for a showcase for Jabari. And I think this exactly what you said was the feedback that I got. Do we expect him to be one of the most productive freshmen in college basketball this year? Probably not. But just based on size, skill set, how NBA teams look for sort of modern you know, three fours uh, at the next level, he really stood out as a guy that has big time, big time ceiling, big time potential. If you're willing to be patient, got to work on his body, what have you. Definitely a guy that I think drew a lot of praise uh, early on. Adrian Griffin uh, Jr., another guy that has a lot of, a lot of fans right now. Now he's, he's injured. Uh, again, for Duke, I don't think we have an outlook right now on on how long he's going to be out or what that injury is going to be. But this is a guy who actually has struggled with injuries throughout his high school career. So scout a little bit less than some of the other guys. But again, another guy with an NBA body, obviously an NBA pedigree um, coming into this. What do you think about his game? Yeah, the injury is a real bummer with him. Um, you know, I, I, you know, I think they said maybe a month, but like you said, it's kind of unclear. So I don't, you know, I'm, I'm supposed to see Duke twice in November. Uh, I'm hoping he will play in at least one of those games. But, um, you know, he's again, he's a player I have not had as, as much of a chance to scout in person because, you know, he was often you know, dealing with different injuries during high school, kind of had an unfortunate stretch. I don't think any of it was super serious, but it was just enough nagging things that kind of compounded. Um, so I don't want to act like I have as great of a feel for him as some of the other guys. Um, but... Uh, you know, definitely a guy who, you know, has the pedigree, you know, has comes from the NBA background with his dad. Uh, and, um, you know, people are expecting him to be Duke's second best player uh, when healthy. Right. So that that's pretty much what I've heard, you know, out of that. So um, we'll see. I mean, what, you know, what kind of uh, shooter is he, uh, you know, can he be, you know, consistent? You know, how much will I lean on him as the go-to guy? I don't know. I don't know the answer to those things yet. Um, but, um, you know, definitely with lottery potential, uh, I think, you know, the health will come into question a little bit uh, just because there's been enough little things here and there. Um, but my, again, my understanding is that none of, none of that injuries in high school were so serious to my knowledge that it would be a huge issue going forward. So I think he just has a lot to prove and hopefully he gets back on the court, you know, by conference play. Let's talk about Peyton Watson, uh, UCLA, another, a very versatile player, can play multiple positions on the floor, did play for Team USA in those under-19s as well. Uh, what are you expecting from him? Uh, yes, yeah, so, so most, of, most of what I've heard surrounding UCLA has been that Watson is probably going to be my, – my guess would be he probably comes off the bench to start the season. Um, you know, they have a lot of guys there. Uh, they have a lot of expectations there after you know what happened last year. Um, I would not expect him to be one of their best players, right? He's, it's sort of like he's going to, you know, if he does end up in the lottery, it's going to be kind of like Jabari Smith where it's like the, the potential here is evident. We don't really know what else it's going to be. Um, but, you know, he he missed a lot of time. Um, obviously, like, you know, COVID affected everyone, but in California in particular, I, I'm pretty – I think from my understanding was they lost pretty much their whole season – uh, you know, so he played as an under-19 team, but hadn't really had a lot of live game time in a while. So he's a little bit behind schedule in terms of his development with that and, and just, you know, getting game reps. Um, and, and, you know, UCLA, everything I'm hearing is that Hawkes is the guy right now, is, is going to be their best player. Uh, and then he is, you know, the leap that he started to make towards the end of last season is, has, you know, started to carry over. So, you know, between Hawkes and Juzang, those guys are going to shoot a lot. So, so Watson, we'll see what his role ends up being. But certainly – you know, really rangy athlete, uh, has a lot of potential on offense. Um, has kind of, I, I don't know exactly what his role is going to be yet. Like if he's going to be a, you know, go to give him the ball guy or if he's going to be more of like a supporting guy. I think that this year the answer is probably closer to the latter. Um, but again, if he shows the flashes and he's able to, you know, play a, a meaningful role by the end of the season for them, I think that's, that's what matters. Like if he, if he's only playing 10 or 15 minutes, you know, the first part of the season, I wouldn't like stress about it. Uh, but what, what what they need for him is to be a contributor in February and March. 
we talked about the fact that this isn't a, a particularly strong uh, draft for guards. As you start to get into the late lottery, mid first round, three three point guards, three freshman point guards sort of stand out. J.D. Davison, who's playing at Alabama, Ty Ty Washington at Kentucky, uh, Kennedy Chandler at Tennessee. Do you have a favorite between those three? Um, I'll say Davison is the guy who I am most intrigued by, um, just off what I've heard. Um, you know, I, I have not watched him play live. I didn't get a chance to see him. Uh, I think I'll see Alabama probably play in December. Um, but he, you know, what he has is, you know, he has the size. He definitely has the athletic ability. He's explosive. Um, you know, he's a underrated passer. You know, he's, he's not like a gunner. You know, his, his jump shot, I think, is, is going to be the big question. Um, but, you know, from the tools perspective, he has the other two guys beat. Um, you know, if his playmaking is – you know, is as good as people seem to think, uh, then I, you know, I think he's probably a good, you know, candidate for the lottery in the thin guard class. Um, but again, it's very hard right now to be a point guard who is not a good shooter. Uh, you know, if you have the ball, you got to be able to threat, be a threat. So, uh, for, for him, that's going to be the big key, you know, how workable is the shot? And I don't know the answer to that yet. Uh, but and if some I veterans in, and some right. veterans in that backcourt at Alabama, that's right. Well. But I, I think that'll benefit him. Like, you know, I think your Quinterly will have the ball a pretty good amount. Uh, you know, Davidson will probably be able to grab and go and transition and kind of showcase that without having to do everything right away. So of those three, he's the one who I would say has the highest upside for sure. Ty Ty Washington getting some praise out of Kentucky's pro day yesterday on Sunday uh, as well. Some general managers really like him kind of came on a little bit later uh, as well. What do you think about his NBA prospects? Yeah. Um, so the, the sense I get is he'll probably play some on the ball and some off. So it'll be kind of interesting to see, you know, what type of a playmaking role he ends up taking because they have Severe Wheeler, uh, who they brought in to play point guard, and he's, you know, he can only play. He's so small; that's his, his only role he can really play is, is on the ball. So, uh, so I, my guess is he'll play sort of a combo role. You know, I've heard he's a very good shooter. Uh, I haven't been able to see him live either yet, but uh, you know, like you said, a guy who came on late, uh, you know, flipped from Creighton to Kentucky. You know, the, the hype kind of gradually built with him and. Um, you know, if I had to guess right now, he's probably Kentucky's most like intriguing player. Like they have Damian Collins, but he seems more of a project. Uh, he's kind of Greg Brown this year, right? Like he could, Damian he Collins, could be. like freak freak athlete, could go either way. Greg yep. Brown went the wrong way, right? Uh, you know, sometimes the the freak athletes go the other way. He does seem to be like every scout like is really intrigued, but they just really have no idea is he a basketball player? Like he's right. clearly clearly an elite athlete, but is he a basketball player? Didn't work out for Greg Brown. It'll be interesting to see what David right. Collins can do. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, he's somewhere on the Greg Brown, Isaiah Jackson scale. We don't know where, <laughs> but <laughs> right. Yeah, which so is kind of the whole question, right? But um, I think with Washington, the other key thing is just, you know, we'd all like him to play 30 minutes a game. Uh, but the question is how much will he push for playing time, right? With, with Wheeler there and with Kellen Grady, probably, you know, playing shooting guard, you know, are they going to play three guards? You know, how much will Washington force the issue? And, you know, I mean, you, you can think about Shea Gilgis Alexander. Not, I'm not saying he's that kind of type of player, but I'm just saying, you know, he kind of forced the issue late and then was a whole different player by the end of his season at Kentucky, right? So maybe maybe it's a scenario where Washington, his role increases by conference play. I don't know. Uh, but certainly I think if you had to pick one guy from Kentucky to, to, to watch closely, I think he's the one who intrigues me the most. All right, last question for you. We've we've gone this whole podcast and we have not talked about a, a sophomore, junior, or senior uh, in college basketball. That's that's pretty much the norm when we're talking about NBA draft at the top every year. It's dominated by freshmen and and young international prospects. And these are the all the new shiny objects. These are ones that you know we're getting to to really scout at the at the NBA level for the first time. I think the consensus is Jaden Ivey is the best non-freshman college basketball prospect in the country. I, I think that's that's clear to see why I actually really like him. I think I think he's going to be a lottery pick. So my question to you is not about Jaden Ivey. Uh, <laughs> it's where it gets wide open after that. Like who's the next best returning college basketball player not named Jaden Ivey? Uh, and do they even have a shot at the lottery? Yeah, um, it's a great question. I think that's why, you know, when we're talking about the depth of the draft, I think the fact that that question is so hard to answer kind of tells you what you need to know about, you know, why we don't really know how good the draft is yet because they're going to be guys who make leaps. We don't know who they are yet. Um, 
but like you know on, on my list of uh you know sophomores juniors uh i mean i'm interested to see uh you know ben matherin if he will you know make the leap everyone is kind of hoping he would make uh you know he didn't totally light the world on fire at, at the under 19s with canada but he had some good moments right and i i, I think mm-hmm. Uh, you know, he's someone who kind of fits the right mold, you know, to be a top 20 pick. Um, I agree with you. You know, Ivy is pretty intriguing. Uh, so I, he would be my top, you know, sophomore. Um, and I, I mentioned Jaime Hawkins earlier. You know, he's not a crazy upside guy, but I do wonder if he can be like this year's Corey Kispert, where he's just so solid and like bankable that teams kind of start to overlook the things that the physical stuff and whatever you want to point out and just kind of focus on the production. You know, I'm wondering if he can kind of play his way into the top 20. I don't know. Um, but, you know, I, I saw him play a couple times in the NCAA tournament and was really, really impressed just with his, his skill level and his polish and his poise. And, um, you know, we'll see. I mean, I prefer him to Johnny Juzang. So, you know, we'll see what happens with him. And then um, the last name I want to throw out is Keegan Murray from Iowa, who's like not a, you know, not a really, we don't know how he really scores yet, but he may shoot enough to just be like such a good defender and like solid guy that you, you know, see him kind of take that leap into the top 20. So I'm very curious. I'm fascinated to see, um, you know, how he is deployed offensively and if he's, you know, focal point or not. Uh, I think Iowa plays Purdue in December. I think I'll probably go to that. That's on, that's on my early season travel. Well, I can drive there now from here. So. Yeah. it's And it's really fascinating. You know, Keegan Murray is a sophomore, but will almost be 22 years old right. uh, on draft night. So a little bit older of a sophomore as well, which is, yep. you know, again, NBA teams are looking at things like this and calibrating age and and different things like that as well. So it'll be really interesting. I, I'm with you. It's it's hard. I feel like whatever you're doing with the with the returning college players, you're you're projecting a lot uh, based off what they did. Like I, I'm I'm really intrigued to see if Jabari Walker can mm-hmm. can uh, play off what he did in the NCAA tournament in Colorado, and then you've got a six nine jump shooter like that. Uh, you know, could re- could really be intriguing for me. But it's it's tough after watching all of his freshman games at Colorado, as opposed to just, uh, you know, a couple, you know, I spent some time over the summer digging back into him. He, he kind of caught me by surprise a little bit in the NCAA tournament. I'm like, okay, I could see this going either way. Yeah. Uh, and I think that's, that's true for a lot of the different prospects right now. So it's going to be one of the things that's going to be exciting is, as you say, every year, there's going to be one or two returning college players that just surprise us and end up climbing, you know, r- up into the ranks this year. And I, I, don't, I don't really know other than Jaden Ivey, who that guy's going to be. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think, yeah, we're going to have to watch a lot of early season games to try to figure that out. Um, yeah. Like, do you think Caleb Love can turn a corner? I don't know. You know, because he was just so – I would bad. like to I would like to say that I feel good about him, you know, regaining his, you know, first-round stock. But I don't just because he was so bad as a freshman. I just – it's hard to make that leap and still be fair to the kid. So, you know, we'll, we'll see how he, how he does. I'm, you know, curious to see him. And um, I'm trying to think if there are any other – sort of interesting uh a few, you know, a few yeah. returning guys marcus bagley yeah um you know was in the draft and he's returning i mean he's sort of interesting alan flanagan who's injured right now i think was certainly a guy that was on some people's watch list earl timberlake who i don't believe played in that combine uh the pro day right uh, oh no he, he played Timber- he played i know he did I play i didn't think he was particularly impressive um i'm not he's not really my type of player uh but yeah, yeah he, he, he did play Okay. Uh, it, it didn't get a lot of love. So if I didn't think he played talking to NBA teams as well, it also meant that there wasn't a, <laughs> there wasn't, wasn't any real buzz about him as well. So, you know, as going through the list, it's uh, uh, Tavion Kinsey out of Marshall might, might be the first senior off the board. Hmm. Yeah, uh, no, he could be, he could be, he, he was pretty good last year. Yeah. Yeah. It's, 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 it's a tough, if it's, if it's a tough crop. Oh, for sure. For sure. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like, you know, Mike Miles was really good at the under 19s. You know, will he have a really good year for TCU? Maybe, but is that enough to get him in the first round? I don't know. <laughs> you know, yeah. it's a it's a very yeah. very intriguing. Yeah. Uh, but but that's that's why we watch the games and and like I said, people take leaps and uh, it's always fun. Well, Jeremy, we'll bring you back uh, mid season and and kind of see <laughs> whether our early season predictions were right about some of these guys. You know, last year we talked about a lot of these guys too. Some guys like Greg Brown washed out. Some guys like Jalen Suggs like took a quick leap really quickly uh in the in the season and and secured their place at the top of the draft and so i'm sure i'm sure sometime around you know february we'll start to have a better feel for uh where all these guys are going to stack up in the season 
He's Jeremy Wu. You can check him out at sportsillustrated.com. Uh, he's getting ready to write a, another column about some of the combines and some of the 2022 NBA draft prospects. And also check me out over at nbabigboard.com and listen to Chad Ford's NBA Big Board on the Lockdown Podcast Network. Aloha.